In today's lesson, we are going to be looking at statistical bias. So we have mentioned bias previously when we looked at um, effective surveys in the previous lesson. We're going to look more at specific types of bias and maybe how we might be able to recognize them as well as what things we can do to change them or to try to reduce them. So the first type of bias we are going to look at is sampling bias. Now, sampling bias is bias that occurs when the sampling does not reflect the population being studied. So this is usually caused by the method of sampling or data collection, right? Because that is how we gather our information. That's how we survey. So if the method of sampling or, or how we're collecting our data um, is skewed or it's, it's improper, that can cause some sampling bias. So some things that might affect or create sampling bias is one, a non-random sample or sampling method, right? So how we select the individuals um, to complete our survey, to gather data from, how we select those subjects. Um, if it's non-random, such as asking your friends, that can affect the data that we collect. And that may not necessarily reflect the population what you and your friends think may not actually be necessarily be what the entire population thinks. Just think, of, think about things at school or what you and your friends think or what you and your friends like um, consistent with what everyone likes. Right? There's, so there is some bias with the fact that you're only choosing your friends. So when you're selecting or creating a survey, you want to make sure that you are asking um, a random group of people so you get everyone's perspective. Another example of sampling bias could be that it, you're using too small of a sample. So again, what we mean by that, you're using or you're not looking at a large enough group for the population that you're studying. Right? So if you have too small of a sample, that can affect the results as well, and it may not reflect the population. So for example, if you're surveying 30 individuals about issues relating to Font Hill, that would be a sampling bias because there's not a there's not a large enough group to accurately represent or reflect the population that you're looking at. 30 individuals aren't going to be enough to represent all of Font Hill, right? You wouldn't want 30 people deciding what's going to happen in the school, right? If you have an input, right? You want to make sure that there's more than there's a large amount of people so you get a varying or you get a large range of information or responses. Now again, those responses may all be the same, but we don't know that only looking at a small group of people. So similar to how if you were only to ask your friends a question compared to asking all the students in the school or all the students in your grade, you can see how you might get differing opinions or differing results. So what we're going to look at next is just a couple of situations and we're going to see where there might be some sampling bias. So to determine how students feel about the Spirit Week events, 20 students were interviewed through a random selection of student numbers. So where is the sampling bias here? Where is the, where is the issue where this does not accurately represent the population? Well, you have to think about, well, what is the population? What are we looking at? Well, we're looking at students. So you can assume that we're maybe looking at a school, a university, a college, something like that. So we're trying to see what does the student body think? What, is their, what are their feelings towards the Spirit Week events? Now, we're only interviewing 20 students. And they were randomly selected. So the issue here isn't the selection because it is randomly selected. So we're not having a say in what students we're picking, right? We, it, it's a random selection. We have no idea who we're picking. Maybe we're just a random number generator to pick, to pick the student numbers and we interview them. So there's no issues there. However, we are only looking at 20 students. So if you think of looking at the school, right? There may be 700 students there. 20 students is not a good representation of 700. So 
So we're only looking at 20 students, so this is a very small sample. So ideally, we would want to include or survey more individuals. We would want to survey more students, right? Maybe up to 100 students, things like that. Right, so we want to be careful or we want to make sure that we are surveying enough people to accurately represent the population. In the next example, a person in a shopping mall randomly selected people to interview as they walked by. So what is the situation or what, where is the sampling bias here? So let's think. Where, how does this situation, or how does the sample not reflect the population being studied? Well, there's not a lot of information here, so we might have to make some assumptions. So we don't know how many people we're surveying, but because we're surveying people in a mall, we could probably survey anyone that we want, right? or as many people as we get in the mall. Which, if you think of a mall, there's probably enough people that go through the mall that it does create a large enough sample size. Are we randomly selecting them? Yep, it, it does mention that we are randomly selecting them. Now, now, how we randomly select them may be different, but again, the idea is that we are, it does mention random selection, so we can assume that we are doing a good job at randomly selecting them. What's the only other part here? Well, it does mention that we're in a mall. So we're only surveying people that go to a mall. Now, are the people that go to the mall, do they represent the population of, say, a town? Right. You might say yes. You could also say, well, not many people will go to the mall. Not anymore, really, right? With online shopping and things like that, you don't necessarily need to go to a mall anymore. So it may not be a good representation of the population because not everyone goes to the mall. So the situation here is he only asked people from the mall. Now, again, depending on the survey, obviously it might make sense to only ask people from the mall, right? If you're asking about, okay, what stores would you like to include? Um, but again, you may want to ask people that don't go to the mall because they, those may be the people that you're trying to get to come to the mall, right? So it depends on kind of what the question is, but generally speaking, you want to include people from all, all different situations, right? To get a good representation of the public or of the population. Another type of bias would be non-response bias. So this is a bias that occurs when specific groups are underrepresented in a sample due to low rates of participation. So where certain groups or certain um, certain categories or groups of people it, where they, if they don't participate, that can cause a non-response bias. So example, say telephone surveys tend to have a high level of non-response bias compared to online surveys, right? So again, people may just not respond to the telephone surveys, right? With all the spam people get, they tend to think, oh, it's spam, I'm not gonna answer it, and they don't even pick up the survey, right? Online surveys, you see them all the time, whether you're going into um, trying to watch a YouTube video um, or things like that, um, they're all around. They're really usually really short. You just click a bunch of buttons or you click a bunch of answers and move on to the next one. So. Telephone surveys tend to have a high level of non-response because again, no, people don't want to sit on the phone, answer, or they might think it's spam. So there would be low rates of participation there. Um, it could be specific people. Maybe they only call people that have landlines or only people that have cell phones, which again, you might say um, most people have cell phones, which is probably true, but the people that still have landlines, maybe the elder, elderly or the older um, populations, they wouldn't be represented. You could say the same thing about online surveys as well, um, again, depending on the situation. So 
In an example, a neighborhood survey about children's playground equipment in a local park was sent to randomly selected households. Approximately 30% of people responded, and in particular, people in condominiums tended not to respond. Explain how this situation represents non-response bias and suggest a way to correct it. Well, again, non-response bias means that a certain group um, is not represented because they didn't participate. So in this case, people in condominiums tended not to respond and only 30% of people responded. So you only have 30% of your responses or of your surveys um, completed. So that is a low rate. So you are getting a lot of people that are not responding. So right off the bat, you have something there. And in particular, people in condos are not responding as well. So this is where we are getting the non-response bias from people not responding in general and specifically people from condos not responding. So what could we do to correct this or what could we do to fix this? Well, you might want to try a different sampling method. And maybe how you select the people to complete your survey um, needs to be improved because the people that you're selecting aren't responding, right? So depending on how you selected your, your survey population, maybe you want to change that. You may want to try things if, if you were doing a mail-in survey, right? Maybe switch it to a phone survey or online. Maybe try going in person, right? You get a lot of people going through um, and, and going door to door and asking questions. That would be a way where you can ensure people are responding because right? you, you would have them there in person. If you mail something out, you have to hope that they do want to complete it. Or, or if it's online, again, you want, you're, you're hoping that they complete the survey, right? But if you go door to door in person, then that would kind of ensure um, you probably would get a higher response rate. Now, obviously they don't need to respond to you. They can just say, no, I'm not, I don't have time for that and, and close the door in your face, but you might get more responses um, by talking to them face to face. The next one is measurement bias. And measurement bias is bias that occurs when the measurement technique has errors which cause unreliable results. So we talked about the surveys um, needing to be reliable, meaning if you repeat the survey multiple times, you get the same answers or you would get the same results. So if there's an error in the survey that would cause you to get differing results or in the sampling methods um, that would cause you to get differing results, um, that would be an example of measurement bias. If you think back to um, our trig assignment when we were looking at measuring our stride length, if we didn't have our ruler set up accurately or maybe it wasn't pulled tightly, um, that would cause some measurement bias because there was an error in our measurement technique, in, in, in the literal measuring technique that caused unreliable results. When we're dealing with gathering information and surveys, we're looking at the survey itself and causing unreliable results or the survey having errors. So an example might be multiple choice questions. Maybe they, they may not offer enough choices, right? So if you don't have enough choices and you only have a few, maybe four, right? Because you, you're limited to how many choices you put down there. The results may be skewed towards those choices, even though that's not um, the correct response or that doesn't represent the population that type of thing. So we want to again find the bias in the following question. Who do you think is the best female tennis player of all time? Maria Sharapova, Serena Williams, Eugene Bouchard, or other? So what are the errors in this question? Thinking of measurement bias, right, going back to what we just talked about, there, is, there are some issues with this survey, or with this question in particular. 
for trying to look at who is the best female tennis player of all time or gather information on people's opinions on female tennis. You could say, oops. well, for one, there's only three players listed. There are more than three players in women's tennis. There's quite a few, all right? We only listed three. So we'd say that for one, there's not enough options. Now they did do a good thing of listing other so that you could put down another option. But sometimes when you're look, creating a survey, you want your, your, you're constrained with time. So you just want to answer it and kind of get it done with. So you only really choose one of the answers that are there rather than submitting your own. You might say that there's not enough variety. Right? These are only the most popular ones, right? These are the really popular tennis players. Now, just because they're, they're popular doesn't necessarily mean that they're the best, right? You, now, again, I would argue that we could argue that Serena Williams is probably one, is one of the best tennis players, let alone best female tennis players of all time. However, the other ones, Maria Sharapova, Eugene Bouchard, those might be there based on popularity rather than actual tennis um, uh, tennis level. I might yeah, if that makes sense. I mean, if people don't know or they don't have an option or they don't know any of them, people may choose at random. Right. So again, one of the limits to having so few options is people may just choose at random if they don't know any of the possible responses. Right. So again, you would want to add a few more. Um, maybe you look at the actual records um, or you look at people who's in, who's in the top, top 10 and kind of go through there. So you would have to put in some effort into um, actually thinking of the responses. It's not just a matter of, oh, I'm just going to list three tennis players and that will give me a good result. Finally, we're going to look at response bias. And response bias is bias that occurs when participants purposely give false or misleading answers. So this, if they give false or misleading answers, it may be because they do not want to be embarrassed or because they want to influence the survey results, right? You can even think of, say, for example, um, those YouTube surveys that we mentioned where you, had, where you would have to answer a question before you were able to view the video. Some people may just put, click something just to get it over with, right? So there's no... There is a response. It's random because like you're randomly being selected, right? They don't have an influence over that, but you're misleading the answers, right? Or maybe you're trying to mislead the answers to um, just to, just to get a result that you know is going to be funny. I mean, you can look up probably situations in the real world. I'm just trying to think of ones off the top of my head, right? There's some situations where um, people gave the public an option to name a tugboat right? and you can think of the names that people came up with and that's what was voted on the nhl did it when they allowed people to write in um write in people or players who they would want to participate in the all-star game right people submitted players names who they thought it would be funny if they saw them at the all-star game not because they were good but because it was actually the opposite they were actually bad so that would be an example of response bias. So another source of response bias is leading questions where the question favors one response over the other. So you're kind of influenced in the, in the question to answer a certain way. So we're going to try to explain the possible response bias in each situation and eliminate that bias. So a class of grade nine boys was asked by their phys ed teacher to put up their hands if they have ever had a date with a girl. So you can only imagine if you're in a grade nine class, 
you're asked to raise your hand whether you've been on a date with a girl or not, how the results might be. Right? Depending on how comfortable you feel in, your, in that class, you may not want to answer it a certain way. Right? Depending on the situation or whatever the case may be, maybe you want to look cool or, um, or not you in particular, but maybe the, peop- the boys in the class, whatever the situation may be, they may, know, may not want to answer truthfully because they're going to be singled out if they raise their hand or not. Right? So that may influence them to answer in a particular way. And it, that way may not be truthful. So what you want to do in something like this, make it oops, anonymous. If I can spell that correct. I think there's two ends. So you want to make it anonymous, right? Don't let every other participant see what someone else put down, right? And we did mention that when we talked about effective surveys. You want to make sure that participants feel that their questions are going to, or their answers are going to be anonymous. Following the last one, a survey question asks, do you think the Liberty government should be reelected to continue its good work on the environment? So this is an example of where there is a leading question. So this question is stating that the government is doing good work on the environment. So they're telling you like, oh, like, hey, we're doing some really good work. You should reelect us, right? So it's kind of already planting that seed of that, oh, I'm doing, they're doing something good. I should allow them to continue to do that. Right? So if you wanted a truthful, honest answer, you would take out this whole part about whether or not, or about what they're doing with the environment. Because that would be a misleading question or a leading question. If the question was just, do you think the Liberty government should be reelected? That allows someone to give their response without having any other influence there. By having that other part, but to continue to do its good work in the environment, that's that's misleading, right? That's kind of planting the seed that the government's doing something good so they should be allowed to continue. So again, the main thing here is just looking at the different types of bias, how they can occur, and some of the questions, or some of the ways that they can occur, um, so that when we're creating surveys and things like that, Um, or we're going through and collecting data, that we try to eliminate as much bias as possible so that it doesn't skew our results. Because again, we want to make sure that the data we collect is accurate and reliable and valid.